This is the Business Growth Hacks Podcast, presented by Beefy Marketing. Here's your host, Andrew Brockenbush. What's going on, small business nation? Welcome back to another episode of the Business Growth Hacks Podcast. John, what's up, my friend? Man, How are you it doing? is I'm really excited to be I got here. Two jo- I got oh, two yeah, you got to specify. Yeah. Awesome. You gotta, I got to be specifically clear. It's all good. I'm excited. I got two Johns, which is so funny because here at Beefy Marketing, we actually we, have two Johns on our mm-hmm. staff. So I'm already really bad about this. I have to call everybody by their last name. <laughs> yep. So. I'll, I'll be good. I promise. I'll be I'll be mindful of that today. I want to let you guys know today's episode is brought to you by Wingman. Wingman's all-in-one marketing and sales automation software helps you streamline your communications, automate your processes, and grow your business. Check them out. Trustyourwingman.com. Let's do it like we always do. Let's kick this thing off with an icebreaker. Let's kick it. Ice, icebreaker. <laughs> All right, John Morris, this one is for you, sir. What is the most interesting or unusual talent or skill you have that not many people know about? Oh, that's, uh, you definitely caught me. I don't know exactly <laughs> what I would say. I don't have anything that's that unique. I can kind of a boring. And so I think I will disappoint people in that no, regard. It's, it's okay. Fritchie, oh, what do you got? Well, John thinks about it. Fritchie, well, yeah, what do you well, got? He thinks <laughs> about it. You know, I guess it's not really unusual because everybody has to do it to live, but I can actually cook. Like, 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 like hot dogs cook or like you can nah, cook, cook. Like, like I can get in the kitchen and make some, some meals. You can get down and cook some I, meals. I can make so the sides meals. and the barbecue. Nice. I'll, I'll tell you something interesting about me in a previous life, but uh, I used to do tons of triathlons and marathons. And in one summer I did six triathlons and two marathons. All right. Uh, you, thought you, were gonna, you, thought, me. you thought you were going to disappoint. That is no. that is not a disappointment at all. Like I, yeah. no, that's that's one awesome. Of, one of our old clients is a, a guy that many people know about, David Goggins, and uh, Goggins is one of those guys that just like whenever I, I used to spend some time on the road with him whenever we were on this event called Patriot Tour together. And when we were on the road, I'd come down six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning to the hotel lobby. And he's like standing there and what looks like somebody poured like a mop bucket of water on the floor. It was like, <laughs> dude, like, what is that? And he's like, oh yeah, I just finished a 22, 23, 26 mile run. And you're just like, what is wrong <laughs> with you, bro? Like, yeah. like he is all that you, that you see online. It is a, yeah. a real life version. I will say whenever I spent time with him, I was skinnier because I was highly motivated to, <laughs> to be a better not version run. of myself. So maybe I need to call him up and tell him he needs to spend a year with me or something like that so I can get back after it. But uh, uh, most interesting thing for me, I think that I don't – I'm going to go with this just because I think it's a little weird. Whenever I was a kid, I had one of those karaoke machines, and I thought that I was an auctioneer because I would go with my dad to the cattle auctions – every single week. And Uh so I just thought it was so fascinating. And so as I got older, I actually talked to another auctioneer. I was probably like 14 or 15. And he told me, Hey, you know, to be an auctioneer, you have to have a filler word. And his filler word was bit of dumb, 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 bit of dumb. Well, I was like, okay, like that's super helpful. Like I can do that. And so I came up with my own filler word, which is mana now, mana now, mana now, mana now, mana now, quarter now, mana now, seven, quarter now, mana now, eight, now, quarter now, mana now, mana now, nine. And so I, I kind of created this idea that I could be an auctioneer. And so uh, that is probably a little hidden talent I have. I am not a professional auctioneer by any means. Um, <laughs> I actually got a chance to go speak to a group of Texas auctioneers a couple of weeks ago. And these guys are just legendary. Like uh-huh. some, of them, some of them sing, some of them like are crazy. Some of them are calm. Like just the, the differences of cadence and pace and how they do it. And just the fact that they can like, get the crowd so pumped up. There's something still to this day that I'm just so fascinated about with the auctioneer stuff. Second career for you? I know. I mean, I guess whenever the agency stuff doesn't work out, I guess I'll just go be a cattle auctioneer or something. (laughs) I don't don't, don't, know. You know, Andrew, I've never heard you actually do that before. I've heard you talk about it, but I've never (laughs) actually heard you do it. You actually do some auctioneer talent there. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, man. Yeah, it's pretty pretty crazy. But uh, hey, well, we've got a great guest lined up for you guys. John Morris. At the age of 30, John Morris started a digital marketing agency called Rise Interactive. When John sold Rise 16 years, years later, it was one of the largest independent digital agencies in the world. John's framework for growth is the foundation of this episode and is applicable across a variety of verticals to help business owners scale their companies. John, thanks again, man, for being on the show today. Really, really excited to be here. 
Thank you both yeah. for having me. Yeah. So obviously we're a marketing agency. So this is going to be yeah. a really fun and easy conversation because selfishly, I hope to learn from you. I hope that you can school me and teach me a few things. Uh, and secondarily, like I think that there's a realization that I had probably a year ago, which was the idea that even small businesses like ours, we're a team of six, um, we're you know, I don't know, $750,000 annual recurring revenue. Like that's kind of where we're at. We're not a massive agency. We're not a tiny yeah. agency. Um, but we never realized the importance of a budget. Never in the last 10 years that I think there was a need for us to create a budget. Um, yeah. I was budget, budget mindful. Like I knew where I was spending <laughs> money and I, I, whatever, but I wasn't actually setting aside funds for different things. It was actually kind of this really crappy situation where last year we had to buy like four or five new laptops because everyone's laptops on the teams were just like ready to, yeah, to yeah. go out. And I was like, holy crap, we just dropped like 15 grand in new computers. And I didn't have money set aside for that. This is like money we're just pulling out of <clears throat> thin air essentially. And so um, I finally sat down last year and said, oh, we have to have a budget. Like, why? Obviously, like, duh. But like, I just didn't understand the value. So I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Why don't we take it back, though? Can you can you start by kind of sharing your journey from scaling your agency from 12k to 35 million? I mean, that's a that's quite the feat. Yep. So uh, I went to University of Chicago for business school. I entered an annual business plan competition called the New Venture Challenge. I won ten thousand dollars, which was my seed money to start Rise, uh, and started working out of my home. Uh, and then basically going back to my whole running philosophy, my business was based off of a running philosophy. So as I said, I used to do marathons. Marathon training takes 18 weeks. Mm -hmm. And your first long run is six miles. Your last long run is 26.2 miles. And I started to have the mindset, you know what? I'm going to create a business and I don't worry about the exit. My exit strategy was I was going to die one day. And I basically said, you know, rather than weeks, I'm going to think of it as years. And rather than miles, I'm going to think about it as dollars. And so the idea was, if I'm going to do $12,000 in my first year, which is what I did, well, my second year, I just want to do more. In my third year, I just want to do more. So it was a very incremental approach to the business. And it goes back to this idea of budgeting. It's, you know, it's actually a perfect time to talk about it. It's July 7th at this moment. I realize this will release at a different date. Um, and I would start thinking about next year right around now. And I'll be thinking about what do I want to do in sales? And what investments do I need to make to make that happen? And so every year I would make investments to make it so that the following year would be a better year. And so I took this incremental approach and I went from 12 million to 80,000 or 12,000 to 80,000 to 350 to 750 to 1.1 to 1.1. That's my asterisk year, 2009. And then I went on a tear, 2 million, 4 million, 8 million. And it just kept on going uh, every single year. Uh, we had double or triple digit growth. Um, and so, a lot of it had to do with the investments we made, the strategic decisions. And don't get me wrong, I can I can give you plenty of mistakes we made along the way, but we learned from those mistakes. We learned from our losses. Um, so to me, I think it was a couple of things, having a long mindset and a growth mindset as well. Um, as you said, you were hoping to learn something today. I would say 99% of my knowledge is stolen from somebody else. You know, I'm just taking their ideas, trying to be a good listener uh, and implementing what I think is right and what I don't think is right. Um, and so uh, and I'm happy to go into detail, whether it's the team, the investments in sales and marketing, the investments in the product. You know, I can take this on all different avenues, but it all comes down to your uh, your budgeting and your approach and also understanding benchmarking numbers. Did you have prior experience in the kind of finance space or i mean obviously you're a young guy did you have any like did you grow up in a family with like it seems like you really had like a grip on the importance of i mean obviously the running component but like these benchmarks and these metrics and these goal setting that they, they, that honestly are things that shit i'm i've been doing this since <laughs> 2013 i'm just figuring out in the last three or four years and i'm just like yeah. and i know it because i do it in my personal life and my personal budget 
But for whatever reason, that just didn't translate into my business. So I started my first agency right out of college, 1996. I literally uh, moved in one day and started my agency the second day after I graduated school. And um, it was not successful. I did it for about five years. I grew it to about 10 people uh, and I lost about 80% of my revenue all in September of 2001. Hmm. And it was three clients all at the same time. And uh, that was like the dot-com crash time period. And for many years, I blamed the dot-com crash. I used to tell people, I was like, you know, it wasn't that the pendulum swung the other way. It, someone cut the pendulum. And But the reality is there were a lot of businesses that were still very successful that grew out of that time period and whether, were able to weather the storm. And so it started with self-reflection. Um, there were two things that I really thought I did a poor job on in my first agency. The first one was finance management. And the second one was HR management. And so... Uh, when I went to business school, uh, University of Chicago is known for its finance department. And so I concentrated in finance and got a degree in finance from there. Uh, so that was a big reason why I went to business school was to get stronger financial acumen. Uh, but then I also, I was very fortunate, uh, fortunate a few different things. One, I was 22 when I started my first agency. And you had all of these 22-year-olds that were creating IPOs and are really successful. And so there was a lot of people, because I was in the internet space and because it seemed like I knew what I was doing, I could talk a good story, uh, were willing to give me time. <clears throat> and so I, I asked a lot of questions and I learned a lot. And so I started to learn a lot of these benchmarking numbers, which I'll, I'll share shortly in this episode. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example. One of them is 20% year over year growth is considered like the benchmark number that they typically want an agency to have. Uh, they want you to have 20% EBITDA or 20% of your revenue is profit. And so uh, as I learned these numbers in the second go around, I decided I was going to really focus on uh, really having strong fi financial acumen from the very beginning. And the second thing is, uh, are you guys sports fans at all? Or, you know, yeah. and what, what's your sport? Baseball. 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 Okay. So if you think about it, you have nine starters, mm -hmm. right? And how many times have you talked about, you know, I'm guessing the Houston Astros are your team? Yep. You know, how many times you're like, why is that guy still pitching? Or why is that guy in first <laughs> base? Like, you know, and you think about the amount of time and energy a professional sports team puts into selecting one of their players. Mm -hmm. uh, I put the same time and energy and, and made a really strong decision that my first 10 people are going to be superstars. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite examples is uh, there was an employee of mine who was good. He wasn't great. He was good. And I would say that 95% of companies would have kept him. And I ended up replacing him with a person named Sean Roach. Uh, Sean, uh, to this day, is still one of the best digital marketers I could ever possibly imagine. And, um, and it, I paid him the same amount of money. But it was like literally going from like a stock growing at 5% to a stock growing at 300% for the same level of risk. And so I really was focused on just building this superstar team that allowed you to, you know, just do things that teams of 30 or teams of 40 were doing. And so that was the two big things that I learned from my first failure that helped me rise to success. Hmm. I mean, those benchmarks are so helpful too. I mean, I know we've not even gotten like to deep dive into that, but like, yeah. I feel sometimes like as an agency owner, like I'm kind of out here on this like island all alone. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's no, 
in the, there, I can't say that there's no community in in the agency world. There is, but it's yeah. a little cut. It's a little cutthroat too. Like everyone, like f- seems like that. There's just you know. I think most of us that are successful or, or have had success know that there's a lot of business to go around. But it seems like a lot of like the the younger agencies seem to think that like they're just going to rule the world. And it's like it's like slow down, you mm-hmm. know. So, you know, uh, but in that, like, I feel like even in that regard, like I've only recently begun to find like my community in the agency world where I feel like yeah. comfortable enough to talk to other agency owners about, you know, what's working for you, what's not working for you. But like those benchmarks, like you can, you can hop on Google right now and search like, what are the, the prop, what's the best profitability for a restaurant and things like that. Right. I'm sorry about that. Oh, you're good, John. I did not realize my ringer was on. No problem. Um, you know, like you could look up restaurants and see like what's the profitability rate or or should be, and it would be easy to find those metrics. Like I feel like, again, up until the last few years, I didn't even know that that kind of stuff existed or maybe it's not readily available for agencies. Like I have no idea like what my profit should be. I have no idea <laughs> what like my year over year growth should be. Like I'm just striving to like do as, do the best I can. So yep. I, I'm, I'm certainly intrigued by that. But before before we kind of get more into that, I mean, can you talk a little bit about how setting goals is connected mm-hmm. to all of this? How Absolutely. important is goal setting? Absolutely. So the reality is your budget, I keep on talking about it, is your strategic plan. Okay. So I can't tell you how many people come to me and say, I really want to grow faster. And so I always follow up with this question. I was like, that's awesome. What percent of your revenue do you spend on sales and marketing? I was like, oh, I don't spend any money on sales and marketing. It's all word of mouth. And and so my response is, well, then there's nothing wrong with that, but you don't really want to grow faster. Because if you did, you would be budgeting to grow faster. Mm-hmm. You know, same thing. I really want to be more innovative. I was like, well, how much do you spend on innovation? It's like, oh, I don't spend any on innovation. You know, so I was like, well, then you don't really want to be innovative. And so uh, I believe that if you want to create a large company, then you have to determine what are the milestones you need to achieve to help you get there. And then once you understand what those milestones are, you have to budget for them. Otherwise, you know, and you might have to sacrifice, you know, uh, I, I mentioned twenty percent EBITDA as the target. I had a five percent EBITDA for many, many years. Uh, I can tell you, my wife did not like the five percent target. She probably would have liked, you know, the money that we could have had if we had the twenty percent target. And you know, I didn't take any money out of the business. I put it all right back into the business. And the idea was that I wanted to fuel growth, uh, and I really focused on top line growth. And eventually I switched to focusing on EBITDA, but, you know, those were, you know, big decisions that I needed to make that allowed me to invest more in sales and marketing. There's, there's only really two ways that you can increase your sales and marketing budget. One of them, which I'll get into is improving your gross margin, which means that you are servicing your customers more profitably. And the second way is that you can lower your profit target so that you have more money for sales and marketing. I focused on both. And I'll go into uh, both those whenever you guys want me to. Um, Yeah. So so really quick, just a quick, I mean, because I know this because I Googled it earlier whenever I was preparing for this interview. But for the (laughs) listeners out there, can you tell us what EBITDA is so that people know exactly what you're talking about there? Uh, EBITDA stands for earnings or profit before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. So interest as in if you have any debt, you are paying interest on the debt. Taxes as it relates to state or federal income taxes. And then depreciation is if you have any capital uh, assets like a building or computers or a car. And then amortization is if you have any assets, but they're soft assets like software. Mm -hmm. And it's a really important number to know because your business is valued off of that EBITDA number or that profit before interest, tax, depreciation and amortization. Um, And so, um, so, you know, I, I foregoed for a long time getting profit so that I could invest more in sales and marketing. Um, and then the other number I really want you to know, this is honestly the most important number an agency owner should know. 
is their gross margin. Their gross margin, and you want to know it as a percent of your revenue, is when you take your revenue, and for anyone that has media uh, as part of their revenue, the media part doesn't count. So no pass-through revenue. It's your true fees that you get as a business minus your cost of service. Cost of service is all the people, the contractors, the technology, uh, travel and entertainment that relates to doing client work that will equal your gross margin. So if you have a million dollars in revenue and you are spending $600,000 on payroll and contractors and technology to service that customers, well, then you have $400,000 in gross margin and your gross margin is 40% of your revenue. It's the 400,000 divided by a million. And what now, percent should we be, what should we be shooting for? So you should be shooting for 50% or greater. 50% or greater. Yep. Uh, and, and here are the general rules that I tell people. Uh, if you are 50% or greater, you will most likely be very profitable and you'll be able to invest back in your business for growth. If you are between 40 and 50%, you are most likely going to have to choose between being profitable or investing in growth. Hmm. And if you are under 40%, you are most likely losing money. And so uh, most companies, I I've now talked to hundreds of agencies. I can tell you that most agency owners do not know what their gross margin is and they do not know how to calculate it. So think about it. I just said it is the most important number to know mm -hmm. and no one is educating them on even what it is or how to know it. Yeah. And so, uh, and I'll tell you, you have two negative forces that go against your gross margin. The first one is that your employees want to get paid more every year and they want to work less hours every year. <laughs> the second truth is that your clients want to pay you less every year, have you work more hours and talk to more senior people. And you're stuck as an agency right in the middle of having to service both these two constituents who are mm -hmm. incredibly important to your business. And so figuring out ways to maintain a 50% gross margin with two negative forces working against you is hard. Yeah. Okay. I explain to people, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, the first thing is know what your gross margin is. Then you can start thinking about what are the different ways that can help you get to the right gross margin. Mm -hmm. this part this part all right sorry i'm like stressed <laughs> out a little bit in a good way because like this is the kind of things that these are the kind of conversations you have to have right um no. i know i don't know what my gross margin is i know it's not 50 percent. like i know with every fiber in my being it's probably closer yeah. to 20 percent, right hopefully right which is yeah. not great uh, again assuming that that's like Minus like operation expenses, minus, you know, payrolls, salaries, contractors, right? It, yeah. it, operation, operations come out of that as well. For example, no. like, so there's okay, a next no. section called SGNA. Okay. Your SGNA stands for selling and general administrative expenses. Okay. So that so is in four buckets. That should be 30% of your revenue. Okay. And that should be sales and marketing. Operations and finance, which is like your finance department, HR, legal, general admin, and corporate IT. Okay. Your executive team and uh, anything that you're doing in R&D, research and development. Okay. And so if you think about it, if you have a 50% gross margin and 30% for your SG&A, that gives you 20% for profits. Got it. And so... The first thing you want to do, I'll just give you an example. Do you use QuickBooks? Oh, we do not. We use FreshBooks, which is an same alternative. Thing. But yeah, same thing. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. You most likely, and most people listening to this who own an agency, most likely have one line item in your income statement that says payroll. Yep. And it's the entire company. And so the first thing you want to do is unbundle that and start moving everything around to the proper bucket. So you're gonna to wanna to be like, these employees do client work and these employees do sales and marketing and these employees are my executive team and these employees are my operations and finance team. 
And that way you can start looking at how much you're spending in these different areas. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that will start giving you the clarity that you need. So like in the 30%, um, you want to spend about 8% of your revenue on sales and marketing. You want to spend 7% on your executive team. You want to spend 15% on operations and finance. And this, this I think you'll find really interesting. There are 120,000 agencies just in the United States. Of the companies I've benchmarked, which is a much, much smaller subset number, 77% of them spend zero on R&D. Hmm. And the reason why I bring that up is every single agency out there has thousands of competitors. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of them are not spending on anything that's going to make them unique or different. Hmm. And so uh, we recommend generally around 5% of your revenue to spend on R&D. Now, I don't want to get too complicated on the finance side, but you can actually treat that as an asset as opposed to an expense. So it could show up on your balance sheet as opposed to your income statement. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. That, that all of this is really fascinating to me because it's like, mm -hmm. I know that like, I know that I need to be getting more granular and deep diving into like, okay, am I spending the right amount of money on, I, I just had this conversation yeah. with somebody, somebody the other day was like, who are my revenue generating employees versus yeah. who are my operation employees versus like executive? Like, I don't have all that broken up, but I, like, I obviously need it because I need to know where we stand. What about net profits? I mean, where, like as a whole, net profits, where should an agency or just any business be aiming to kind of land? So EBITDA generally is the number that people benchmark after that. If, if you look at it, there's going to be a few different expenses that fall after EBITDA. So the next one is your depreciation and amortization. Generally, that's close to zero. Uh, most people don't have, you know, we're not a high asset type building. And as I just said, no one's investing in technology that they're spending zero in R&D. Uh, there could be some ancillary like um, revenue called other income or ancillary expenses called other expenses, but generally that's close to zero after that. Uh, the next one is taxes and interest. And I generally tell people that you should target 35% of your profits to pay your silent partner, which is the state uh, and federal government. Yeah. And yeah. then if you have any debt, you should have interest as well. So if you think about it, uh, it should be about 35% less, or sorry, 65% of your EBITDA should be like what your net income is, like what you truly have at the bottom of the line. Now, it's actually, it's interesting you brought that up because I literally am writing a blog post on it right this morning. But uh, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of agency owners are an S Corp or an LLC. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that their corporation actually doesn't pay taxes. The taxes flow to them as an individual. That's right. I still recommend that you budget for the expected taxes because you know what? You still got to pay them, whether it's through the business or through personally, you need that money set aside. So I generally recommend 35%. Uh, it is a high number. It is most likely you will not be paying 35%. <laughs> but I would rather you set aside more cash to pay your taxes than be the other way around and be like, crap, I got to go figure out where I'm going to get this money to pay my taxes. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I would second that because I've screwed up before and <laughs> had a lovely uh, direct deposit that I had no control over that came out every month to get caught back up on that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that happened to me early on, too, in, in the agency where I, I just didn't understand, like I genuinely didn't understand, nor did I spend the time trying to learn. Um, yeah the importance of taxes. And all of a sudden I got that first like, Oh, beefy did really well this year. And we got that $15,000 tax bill, which is my tax bill because I were an S corp, right? It wasn't beefy. Yeah. It was and Andrew Brockenbush, you owe 15,000. We're going to like <laughs> levy your bank account. Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, okay. This is kind of scary. And, um, fortunately over the last few years, I've, I've really created a great relationship with the, uh, with an accounting firm and like, they've really helped me sort that out. But you're, you're exactly right. Like now, mm -hmm. in addition to my like regular K one distributions, my earnings, I'm taking another portion out and automatically putting it to a savings account specifically yep. for the purpose of that end of the year tax, you know, estimated tax payments or whatever. Right. So that's so important. Cause I, I mean, mm -hmm. I was freaked out the first year I saw that bill. I was like, I don't have yeah. $15,000. Like, like, 
Beefy doesn't have fifteen thousand dollars <laughs> worth. Of, where's this invisible fifteen thousand dollars at? But it was like, oh, you had it, buddy. You bought computers yeah. and you bought yourself a nice yeah. truck, and <laughs> yeah. you just weren't allocating the funds to where you know yeah. where they were they were meant to be. So, and they don't accept. Oh, I didn't know as an answer either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. they are a silent partner. They are partners yeah. with you. They didn't sign the paperwork, but you know. Yeah. I've never heard that term before, but I love and appreciate it. That is awesome. Yeah, they don't have any much value either. <laughs> so this next question is is jumping a little bit ahead, um, and I'll, I'm kind of going to go back and forth ADHD through the roof. But yeah. I just think that this is like the right time to ask this question. But like in your experience, how can technology help in surfacing these hidden insights for for mm-hmm. agency owners, for business owners? Um, because I feel like that's the biggest thing a lot of times. Like we just don't have awareness around it. Or we don't well, know that's what actually, metrics to be paying attention to. So That's actually why I started my company. So I haven't talked a little bit about what I do, but I have a technology company called Engine, and mm-hmm. it is specifically designed for marketing agencies of all kinds to help them generate these insights. If you think about, there are only three insights every business or every agency owner needs. Uh, your revenue growth, your profit as a percent of revenue and your cash relative to your monthly overhead. Those are the only three things that you need. Now, underneath them, let's just take revenue, for example, there are three components to growing your revenue. There is new business, there is renewals of your existing business, and there are upsells. And so the idea is, um, I'm trying to help agency owners gain the insights that they need so that they can make decisions as quickly as possible. And I'm trying to do it by giving the fewest numbers of possible. You know, like I I, I think of a lot of people who started their marketing agency didn't do it because they love math. They probably mm-hmm. did because they hated math. And so I'm trying to basically say, how can I help them make decisions in a much faster way? And so that's what Ramsey Innovations does is that we sell budgeting and forecasting software that's really focusing on business intelligence. It's those three insights we want to help business owners understand so that they can make decisions quickly. That is like so needed in our industry, right? Like I remember yeah. like <laughs> there was this company, I can't even remember their name was, but I was using them like, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. And it was like, here's your recurring revenue and here's your predicted recurring revenue. And I was like, Okay, that was like the first like taste of like some of that we got. It was like, oh, we actually have money coming next month. That's yeah. good. <laughs> That's like, good. <laughs> like, what is what is our you know profit and loss statement look like? Am I making more money than I'm spending? I have no idea because I don't know how to look at QuickBooks, right? Yeah. Uh, like that stuff was so important to me because I was like, I don't know like where we stand. I mean, I'm looking at bank accounts. I'm just like, it's stressful. It's like, it's not who I am. Like I'm a creative person, not an, an like, I'm not an overly analytical person. Yeah. So w- when I, obviously I came across your website, you know, I was like, Oh, this is like, there's a lot of data packed in here, you know? And mm-hmm. I think that, yeah. and I think there's other tools for different industries. Obviously you've created an incredible tool for agency owners, but these tools exist, you know, I think for industries, a variety of industries. Do you work outside of the agency space or primarily in the agency space? So, so my goal is to own the professional service space. Okay. Uh, so if you think about lawyers, accountants, management consultants, et cetera, they all have the same benchmark numbers. They all have the same issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we're all figuring out when do we hire people? When do we not hire people to, you know, grow your business? I am starting with, uh, just the marketing space for a couple of reasons. One, it's where I come from. And so I think it just gives a lot of credibility very quickly that because I had a successful agency that, um, you know, I, I build trust from a sales standpoint and from a delivery standpoint. Uh, but the second reason is anyone who becomes a client agrees to share the aggregated data for benchmarking purposes. And so the idea is that uh, as the product gets a little bit further down the road, you are going to be able to filter based on region, size of company, the type of agency you are, and see where you rank on revenue growth, on profit as a percent of revenue, and on cash relative to monthly overhead. And so we, from an 
a growth strategy are going to go after like once we have like the marketing communication industry well underway, we'll then go to the second vertical and then the third vertical and we'll keep on expanding that way. Mm -hmm. That's really cool, man. That that's that's really fascinating. I mean, I think that there's a huge need for that. Yeah. You know, we just we just don't know what we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like even like some of the small benchmarks you shared, like, I don't know if, the, if for the people that are watching the video, you can see me like keep turning around over here. So like, I keep, <laughs> right. keep like it's typing like... in Evernote over here, taking notes and stuff. Cause like, uh -huh. this is so, this is so, this is so impactful for, for me and everyone else out there listening. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to the budget section because I think that like, as I think about our entire audience, the people that are listening to this show, I think that what you're saying specifically in that applies to all of us. Right. Um, yeah what would you say are the key steps involved in kind of starting that budget, creating it for the year? Because I think people would like to know what that process looks like. Maybe kind of highlight any important considerations that we should take, because like I said, it was my first time to ever do it yeah. at the beginning of this year. And it was like, I'm not an, I'm not a, I don't even know what the person's job is that does like, you know, accounting like that where you're creating budget. I was like, yeah. how much do you think we're going to spend on computers? I don't know. How much are we going to spend on yeah. food? I don't know. <laughs> like yeah. I had no idea what to put down. So, I mean, it'd be really interesting to kind of hear what so, your thoughts are on that. So I always tell people to start with revenue. Revenue drives all decision-making. And what you want to do is start with all of your existing clients. And you want to look at your revenue by month and by line of business. And this is generally the first thing that people, um, from what I've taught to a lot of people start thinking of things in annual terms, like, oh, I'm gonna do $100,000 with this client. I was like, no, I want you to break it up by month. And at mm -hmm. some point there's gonna be a renewal period. And so I want you to start asking yourself, will they renew or will they re not renew? Now, we don't know what the future holds, but we do have a good idea of where the relationship is now. Have I had them for multiple years? Did a new person just come on board? You know, are they happy? Are they not happy? And so I, I don't like doing like, you know, like I have a 50% probability that renew because the challenge is when they renew or they don't renew, the decision's binary. You either are getting a zero or you're getting some number. Yeah. And so uh, I like people for every single client, for every single line of business, to predict if they will renew or they will not renew. And then you next thing, which is harder, is to predict any upsells from those clients. Hmm. This will tell you how much revenue you're gonna generate from your existing client base. I, I had a client of ours that did, you know, a pretty decent number, it was around $10 million last year. Wow. And they wanted to do 12 million this year. And when I put the analysis together for them, uh, I told them that they were probably gonna do nine or eight. They didn't really like that number, like, but what? I explained <laughs> that they had, you know, they had three seven figure accounts that, that were not renewing. And yeah. so it's not like they were starting the year out at 10, they were starting the year out at seven. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, you're, yeah, you're going to make up for that and grow. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that gives you a good basis to look at. The next thing you want to look at is new business. Now, new business, I have a very specific definition of it. It is anyone that you win after the beginning of the new fiscal year. So if your fiscal year starts on January 1, if someone signs on December 31st of the previous year, they'll be an existing client. They won't be new. And if they sign in January 1, they will be a new client. And so once you understand that, you first thing you want to do is what I call your named pipeline. These are people that you are currently talking to and that you have some pulse of, am I going to win them? Am I not going to win them? How much will it be? And when will they start? And the same thing, you do it by line of business and by month. Then you have to do the hardest part of your revenue projections, which is what I call blue sky, which is, you know, that you're going to win business. You know, today's July 7th. Beefy marketing is going to win some new client between now and December 31st. You just don't know who it is. You don't know when you're going to win, win it. You don't know what line of business it's going to be for, but you got to project it. And so I generally recommend using your history as your guide. And so... I typically win a new client a month. Well, most likely you're gonna to continue to win a new client a month. 
If you win a new client a quarter, you're most likely going to win a new client a quarter. And you generally have a good idea of what the average size is. You'll have an idea of what the line of business is. And so I use that as the starting point. Now, I've also seen a lot of people like, well, yeah, I just hired a salesperson, you know, so therefore I'm going to have this hockey stick in, in revenue. Um, generally, my recommendation is that a new salesperson, which, by the way, you have a 50-50 chance of them being any good. Yeah. Um, is not going to provide any value until about six months in one sales cycle. You know, it's they're learning your business. They're getting up to speed. They're reaching out to all of their old contacts to let you know what they're doing. It's not like they're like, oh, my God, I have 10 proposals out there already and they're ready to sign, you know, yeah, exactly. on day one. And so it's very hard to immediately move the needle uh, on your new business. But once you have those two numbers, your existing revenue and your new revenue, you now know how much money you can spend. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just say that the number comes out to a million dollars. Well, I just gave you all the benchmark numbers. Now we have $500,000 that we can spend on servicing those customers. And you have $300,000 that you could spend on operating your business. And then you can break it up into the different components. Well, I know that of that 300,000, um, 8% of revenue goes to sales and marketing. So that is going to be $240,000. And so you can start putting in, this is how much you should spend in each bucket. Then you can start looking at, you know, what am I actually spending in each one of these different buckets? And so yeah. that's kind of the guide that I generally recommend people follow. Yeah, yeah, those I think benchmarks are great. Yeah, I think that's great benchmarks. And, <clears throat> you know, you're talking about the different aspects of forming your budget there. It, it makes me question what what do you put into that budget to help plan for uncertainties like recession or things of that nature? So going back to the cash component, I, I recommended that uh, your cash is a multiple of your monthly overhead. On the low side, I want companies to have two times their monthly overhead. I can tell you, just like I told you that no one knows what their gross margin is, mm -hmm. I would say with about 95% accuracy, uh, agencies are uh, lower in cash than I would have liked them to be. Uh, I have a client of mine that is wildly profitable. Like they make a ton of money. And there is no cash in the bank. Like the owners are just taking all the cash out. Oh, um, and so uh, I recommend two times monthly overhead as a minimum that you put into a savings account. And that, that does not go towards taxes. So I always recommend two bank accounts, an operating account, an operating account at a minimum should have one month's payroll plus 35% of your last three months profits. If you never go below that dollar amount, you will always have enough to pay your taxes, your bills, and your employees. Hmm. And then in your savings account, if you have two times monthly overhead as a minimum, um, you will have enough for the rainy day, enough for the recession. But what you'll also have is money for that opportunity that just falls in your lap. Ooh. You know, it's like, oh, my God, my number one competitor is in trouble right now and they're looking to sell and I have money and I can go buy them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the company that bought Rise had a great line and, and it's not overly brilliant when you, when you hear it at first, but I think it really is a brilliant line, which is you can do really cool things when you have a lot of cash yep. and, <laughs> you know, um, and so I, I try to really teach people to focus a lot more on cash, mm -hmm. uh, than I think they normally hear. And yeah. so, you know. Uh, and I, I've had clients, you know, look, there's all sorts of interesting reasons why people have to take cash out of their business. And what I tell people is it's not a light switch. It's not like you're like, hey, I don't have enough cash in the bank. Um, and I'm expecting you tomorrow to just all of a sudden have it. It might take two years to build up the cash. But if we're building the cash up, you know, you're making progress and you're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. How important do you think it is for businesses to regularly review and update their budget throughout the year? That's actually a phenomenal question. So 
Uh, I recommend that they do it quarterly, but they're literally in their budget weekly. Okay. So the first thing I recommend is that you create an annual budget that starts before the beginning of the fiscal year. So I would ideally want your original budget done by November 1st, but December 31st at the very latest, if you're in a January one fiscal year. But then you are going to go through a quarterly reforecasting process. Mm -hmm. And you're going to lock in your original budget and you're going to create a brand new document that is going to be your quarterly, your Q1 forecast, your Q2 forecast, your Q3 forecast, and your final forecast. And you're going to compare what you originally set out to do versus what each of these forecasts tell you to do. Uh, it's, it's another big mistake that a lot of people make is they'll create a budget, but then they just keep on updating the budget and they never lock it in. And so they're never like really holding themselves to something. You mm -hmm. know, it's kind of like saying like, you know, I want to run a marathon. It's 26.2 miles. You know what? I think I'm going to change the definition of a marathon. I think it's going to be 23 miles today, you know, because <laughs> I 26.2 sounds harder. And so the idea is that you set a goal, you communicate that goal. You know, it creates accountability by mm -hmm. locking it in. You're saying like, this is what I want my revenue to be. This is what I want my profits to be. Then reality yeah. hits, you know, it's like, okay, well, that's what we set out to do. How are we doing against our goals? Are we ahead of them? Or are we behind them? And why? It might be like, you know, there was a pandemic and, you know, there was something beyond our control and, you know, mm -hmm. we were in the hotel space and you know what, no one's going to hotels, you know, which I guarantee you their quarterly forecasts look horrible. But the, the, the important thing about doing the quarterly forecast is it is the best expense management tool you have. Mm. So if you do not project your revenue properly by going through this process every three months at a minimum, you can start dialing back your expenses to make sure that you stay profitable. Or if you're killing it, you might be able to make those extra investments that you were looking to make. And so it allows you to operate in a much more uh, intelligent way. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good way to keep your team all on the same page as well. So they all know what their goals are. Like you said, yep. don't just change the distance of the marathon. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm like, and, <clears throat> and also, just one last, last thing. Mm -hmm. If you communicate every quarter on like, this was the original goals, these are the new goals, and you explain the why behind it. It might be bad news, but you know what? People would rather hear that, like, they're, we're all working with adults. Mm -hmm. You know, people would rather hear the bad news, knowing it, or good news. But it, it's the why behind it, and it's what you're going to do about it. You know what? Um, we are not doing a good enough job keeping our customers. And so in, in this reforecast, we're going to spend more money figuring out what do we need to do to improve retention? Or it might be that, you know what, we're doing a great job of keeping our customers, but we're just not winning these deals. We're getting the at-bats, but we're, we're striking out. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to spend a lot more time working on our pitch and how we can make our pitch better. And so, you know, it's how are we doing and then communicating the why and then communicating what are we going to do about it? I'm over here like dusting the cobwebs off the budget I put together last year. <laughs> <laughs> like seriously, like yeah. that's like, it's like a lot of conviction right now, you guys. Uh, yeah. Because it's like, you're right. Like what was the point of putting this budget together? If I wasn't going to look at it throughout the month, throughout the quarters, every, you know, every quarter and be able to say, yeah. Oh shit, we've exceeded that. We can't spend any more money in that area or, Hey, we're way under, we wanted to do this thing. Can yeah. we justify it? Can we do it? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, are we spending enough that it's actually helping grow the business? If we if we budgeted eighteen grand for the year for marketing or whatever the amount was, are you spending that money? Is it is it getting yeah. used? Are you actually growing the brand? So it's like really cool to kind of benchmark that. I'm like looking at my because I, I built it. It's just my spreadsheet is really simple. It's the category, the budget, our actual, and then the difference. Right. Yeah. At the, at the end of the year, where I really should have had it say category budget Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 actuals Actually, so that I could, you know. You even want to do it monthly. So like you want to make sure that you're closing your books every month by the 15th of the next month. 
Uh, I, I just, I do a lot of posts on LinkedIn uh, mm -hmm. on providing tips to agency owners. And literally last week I, I posted that most people don't realize it, but one of the most important things you can do to understand how your business is doing is closing the books every month and trying to mm -hmm. do it by the 15th of the next month. Yeah, and, that's, that's good. Uh, and that allows you to answer just crucial questions. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is so valuable. Well, I, John, I feel like we could do like a part two, part three, part four, because this, <laughs> yeah, this is, going. maybe you are one of the greatest guests we've ever had. Um, <laughs> this is this is one of those conversations I feel like there's just so much to unpack. I really have like 30 more questions over here, but I want to be respectful mm -hmm. of your time. So I have to ask what I ask at the end of every episode. Yeah. Hacks! All right, John, if you could leave us with one business growth hack for business owners, agency owners, kind of at any journey, whether they're a startup, uh, just trying to get the thing off the ground, or if they're already uh, well into their journey, what advice would you leave for us? I'm leaving two pieces of advice. So the first one is your number one goal should be to never lose a customer due to performance. And mm. so if you think of most agencies, there's different types of agencies that are project-based or renewal-based agencies. But if you are a renewal-based agency, if you can hold on to your book of business and then get good at winning new business, your business is going to grow and you're going to have a phenomenal business. Yeah. Yep. The That's second crazy. one is the first 100 days of a contract is more important than the last 100 days of mm -hmm. a contract. And so really mapping out what is that first onboarding experience look like and how do you make it an amazing experience for them? Uh, will shape the entire relationship. Mm -hmm. I love that you shared that one because that's one of the ones we share a lot. That, that, yeah. that first that first 90 days, that first 100 yeah. days is so important. We've really, really at our agency tailored that experience from, from the original calls that we have with the customer to make them feel part of the family to the box that they get in the mail that just makes them yeah. feel even more involved with a, a really nice, like, a beefy marketing coffee mug and yeah. some other really some other really cool some swag. swag. I mean, I get calls all the time. People are like, I, I got the box you sent. Like that was so thoughtful. That was so nice. And I was like, oh yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. other agencies aren't doing that. They're not thinking it's, about the fact that like you have to make a human connection. It's mm -hmm. the mint on the pillow. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. It's that yeah. double tree cookie, you know? Yeah. It is, it's, <laughs> those, it's those little things that go so much further. John, I really, again, appreciate all the value you brought. I seriously think that maybe we could have you back on the show if you'd yep. be happy to come uh, anytime if you'd like to. And uh, I just think that there's so much value you have to offer our audience. Shoot, you have a lot to offer me. I'm <laughs> really excited about maybe doing a demo of your software and seeing how that can help. Can you tell people how they can support you, follow you, find you, all that jazz? Absolutely. You can go to Ramsey, R-A-M-S-A-Y, innovations.com to learn more about Engine and our software. You can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, so John Morris on LinkedIn. I post uh, almost every day. In fact, I actually just created a 90-day challenge for myself to post every day. Uh, mm -hmm. Some tip to help agency owners grow faster. Um, and my email is jon at ramseyinnovations.com. And I love connecting, communicating with other agency owners. That's awesome. awesome. Hey, thank you guys for checking out the episode today. If you liked it, share it with a friend. Make sure you subscribe. Leave us a review if you'd like on Apple Podcasts oh, yeah. or any other platform you're listening. <laughs> Let us know what you think. The only way we know we're not talking into a vacuum is by you letting us know how we're doing, uh, the mm -hmm. kind of guests that you want to hear, the kind of content you would like to hear more of. Again, we appreciate you guys tuning in every single week. Make sure you support our sponsor, Wingman, the all-in-one marketing and sales automation software to help you grow your business. Trust your wingman. Dot com. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Growth Hacks podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you never miss an episode. To get more marketing tips and tricks, follow Beefy Marketing on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Beefy Marketing. And to take your business to the next level, check out our website at www.beefymarketing.com.